Greetings, everyone, and welcome to episode two of the Hyperspace Comlink podcast. This edition of the podcast focuses on the Clone Wars television series and the ripple effects it had throughout the Star Wars universe. Join hosts Kristen and Amin, as well as our guest Mike, as they discuss their favorite moments leading up to Order 66. Your spoiler warnings begin now. Hey guys, this is Kristen, otherwise known as Black Pulsar 13. Welcome back to Hyperspace Comlink. I am here with some great friends as always. We have Amin back with us. And then sadly, Andy could not be here tonight. So we have a special guest, Newman, in his place. If you want to introduce yourself. Uh, yeah. Hey guys, it's uh, Newman from Discord, otherwise known as Mike. Uh, yeah, excited to be here. So today is our Clone Wars special because what else is there to talk about all the time? But before we jump into that, just some general Star Wars news of things that are coming out. Queen's Hope is the uh, next Padme book coming out by E.K. Johnston. That should be out soon. I don't think I have the date pulled up on that, but I am very excited. Anything Padme Amidala. Um, and then we have uh, Victory's Price coming out on March 2nd. That will be the final volume in the Alphabet Squadron trilogy. Um, and then on March 3rd, we have more High Republic comics because who doesn't need more of those? Um, we have the third in just the comics issues and then the second in the High Republic adventures. And then actually the Discord, our next book coming up in the Star Wars book club is going to be Dawn of the Jedi, which I'm very excited for. It sounds super good. So if anybody's interested in jumping in with us on that, that should be really, really fun. But just jumping into the Clone Wars, as always, there's prequel trilogy things to talk about. So I actually just got through some of season seven today. I tried to watch as much of it as I could, but school always gets in the way. And I keep meaning to do the watching season seven along with the like cut into Revenge of the Sith, but I avoided season seven for a long time to avoid the emotional trauma of that. So I'm not sure if I'm ready to add on to that by watching it in conjunction with Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, I mean, that that movie that the, the edited down version is amazing. I really recommend it for anyone out there who wants it. Um, I'm pretty sure it's on Reddit somewhere. It's an amazing edited. The transitions are almost perfect. And um, honestly, it was it was really like whoever did it really knew how to make like sort of Star Wars just classic, um, you know, just the edits and everything and the transitions and everything. It was amazing, honestly, the just to think about, like, honestly, sometimes it's hard to, like, connect in your head the Clone Wars and the pre and uh, some of the prequel trilogies based on, like, the characters' personalities and everything. Because there's two different shows. But with that, you know, with that edited down movie, it just merges everything in your head and it's perfect. Yeah, I, uh, I haven't checked it out yet. But given how, you know, the Clone Wars was originally when it came out and obviously jumping around and now we have a chronological order. I was super impressed with how they did Season 7 with having it, uh, you know, like, actually have clips and bits of uh revenge of the sith kind of edited in i thought it kind of took a page out of resistance's book when they were showing out uh the force awakens from like a an alternate perspective uh with the stuff on star killer base so i thought that was pretty cool when they did that in season seven it is nice to get more of a feel of like what happened right around and directly before anakin's fall in revenge of the sith getting all of that is always really really nice and just I think in Clone Wars in general finally being able to understand how Anakin gets there we a lot of people for a long time at least one of my complaints about the prequel trilogy was that uh, Anakin's fall just didn't make much sense when you jump from episode two to episode three so I love that about Clone Wars and I think season seven does that the best we really I don't know you really start to see more of the anger in him really resonate the show is basically, in my opinion, I, I love it. It's just, it's the greatest thing ever. It's my favorite show ever. Um, and I think the, and like you said, like some of the things like that Anakin, you know, they feel, it feels almost exaggerated. Like why would he turn to the dark side just for, you know, those like small things, like he had a bad dream basically. But no, you see like in the Clone Wars, he has like, you know, Ahsoka leaves the order and he blames himself essentially to an extent. He, I would think he would blame himself. And um, you notice that he has like a lot of uh, trouble in the Zygeria arc, the slave arc. He's like, Zygerian scum, I'll deal with that slaver, right? Um, he's like, he's really angry about it. And it's just because of his mother and how slavery led to her death, you know? I think that's the best thing about Anakin in the Clone Wars. They really show how his anger gets worse throughout the season. You know, it starts out with just R2. He, he loses R2 and 
you know, it's really sad because Artus is like his best friend, right? And it gets worse and worse. You know, he he starts mistrust his his mistrust in the council grows, and then it goes on to just it shows how really Anakin drifts towards the dark side. You know, not necessarily just because oh he killed Mace Windu or he had a bad dream. You know, because his he saw his wife dying in the vision, right, in the premonition. But no, eventually, you know, you actually genuinely see where Anakin's anger really got him to. I think what I really like about the Clone Wars too is. Even I, pre-season seven obviously has the best animation of all of them. Sorry, season seven has all the best animation, but pre-season seven does a really good job still of giving us body language that a lot of other animated shows I don't think do super well. They rely a lot on the voice acting and the lines because body language is a lot easier when you're acting in live action. But just the way the inflections we see on Anakin's face and just watching that anger slowly rise. And then like you just said, with all of those little things that start to really, really, really add up. Yeah. To that point, even the, uh, the snarkiness of Obi-Wan, I think really comes through not only in the voice acting from James Arnold Taylor, but also just the, like, you know, the rolling of his eyes and some stuff Anakin says, and the weird half smirks he gives during their adventures. I mean, I think it, Clone Wars is great. and Obi-Wan is probably my favorite part of the whole thing. Obi-Wan is the sassiest Jedi ever. I mean, I don't know if you guys watched the unfinished Crystal arc. The, I mean, they finished the actual arc, but they didn't animate it. That's one of my favorite arcs now. I mean, Obi-Wan is literally the biggest troller ever. I mean, he's, they're, they're wheeling the crystal down a hallway in the Separatist, um, you know, in the Separatist ship. Obi-Wan literally sees Grievous, right? They're running away from Grievous. He sees Grievous down the hallway. He waves to him and he just turns around. Like it it just blows your mind cuz Obi-Wan is just so chill and he literally doesn't care at all. What people, what like when he makes fun of someone, you know, he makes fun, in the Citadel arc, I think he makes fun of um or the warden or whatever. Um he's the guy that's just like Moralo Evol. I forgot his name though. He he tells him like uh, you know, I wouldn't expect someone with such a soft voice, right? Even though he has like a really low and scratchy, rough voice. It was I love Obi Wan in this show. I firmly believe that Obi Wan is the least afraid of death and out of any character in all of Star Wars. He could have he there are so many people that he just poked fun at, especially in the Clone Wars show, that should have should have just destroyed him, but he knows that it'll be fine somehow. I, I think we should really go back to where it all started with the Clone Wars movie and how we all felt about that. I mean, I watched the Clone Wars movie actually after I'd watched the show. So I I think I'd been like a couple seasons in before I watched it. I don't know why I ended up doing it that way. But so I have more positive feelings about it than I think other people do. I actually don't really remember when I watched it for the first time. I know that, like I didn't watch Clone Wars when it was coming out until probably season seven I, I i used to watch it on like weird eastern european websites that just had like you know <laughs> links to episodes and watch them that way because it was really the only way i could i could get access to it so now having disney plus is huge you know it makes it a lot easier to bounce around and watch everything especially the chronological order i think it's been really streamlined with that yeah i thought it was it was uh it was a really good um movie i really really enjoyed it um rod of the hut is way better than yoda so yeah come at me uh baby yoda sorry uh grogu come at me um anyways so i really liked the idea of the hut families having rada um i thought it was really cool i mean i'm not sure what happens to rada after because i mean if huts um grow to 600 ish years old and he's definitely alive if he hasn't been killed but um I'm ge- i genuinely want to see like maybe a nod toward his toward him or something maybe he like takes Jabba's place or maybe he shows up in the book of Boba Fett no one knows really but I mean I'm not sure how fast outlets grow but yeah I mean in general I thought it was a really enjoyable movie I mean uh seeing Anakin and Ahsoka first meet each other you know they hated I mean they hated each other essentially but um the end like they had really good synergy uh down the you know down the line and it's just you know it shows in this it shows and everything it's really cool Honestly, the freakiest part about my first time watching uh, the Clone Wars is I, the huts freak me out in every way. I don't know why they just I. That was my least favorite part of that movie too. Is just seeing that little baby hut. I was not okay with that. I also, when I watched the movie for the first time, I'd already heard about how much people didn't uh, like Ahsoka originally, and I can see why people would think that automatically. It's uh, it's interesting to come back to it with a different perspective on her. 
I think Ahsoka has um, one of the greatest developments in the in, in any show, aside from Zuko from Avatar. You can't replace that. But um, hard agree, hard agree. Zuko's the best. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's so true. Uh, yeah, um, Ahsoka has really good development because I think she learns from so many different Jedi, not just Anakin and just Obi Wan or Rex. Maybe you know, she learned from so many people. You know, it started out. Um, I think she learned. Uh, essentially she learned from Anakin mostly just not necessarily recklessness I would say it's more um, dis- uh, not even discipline I think she learned discipline from Obi-Wan I would say and uh, generally she learned from Anakin just combat and strategy and also compassion um, she learned that mostly from him but then there was also one thing that stood out to me was when she was with Plo Koon in the lower depths of Coruscant when they're looking for um, who's as to where um, Ela Sakura and Boba Fett are you know and uh, sorry Obi-Wan uh, sorry Mace Windu and Anakin. Um, and when they're trying to find all of them, right? They're in the lower depths of Coruscant and Plo Koon literally tells her, you know, be discreet, right? And she learns from that and then she carries it because she's always discreet in the um, in the arc where she's uh, framed for murder, right? She's really discreet and everything. Um, and then not just that, there was also um, learning from Evan Peel uh, in the Citadel arc. She learns how, you know, selflessness is really the best way because no matter what, he wanted to finish the mission, even though he was like literally bleeding there, right, you know, on the ground. And even though that she lied and she went into the mission, he still wanted her to just carry it through and finish it, right? And um, she learns, you know, also from um, Luminar Unduli, he, she learns uh, a, lot for, a lot about patience, I think, uh, when she was about to like get flattened by the elevator when she's chasing Asajj Ventress on the ship. You know, it's amazing how she learns from all of these different people, you know, and then she accumulates it to the last season you know even from rex i would say she learned discipline the most from him right it's, it's amazing ahsoka's development is amazing that's what makes me more excited for uh, a show about her so far past the clone wars at this point and even just seeing her for those few minutes in the mandalorian um just seeing how she's going to apply all of those things she learned because we see her in rebels a bit but see how she's going to apply all those things she learned as like an adult, quote unquote, someone who's got to be out there in the world is not a Jedi, but um, has a lot of power. And I think a lot of moral responsibility. Yeah. I'm, uh, I, I, something that I hope they do in the, uh, the Ahsoka series is kind of touch more on the connection she has with, and I'm sure Amin knows the name, but the, uh, the condor that represents the daughter from the Mortis arc. I feel like they did this part where they you know just kind of implied that every time that the condor's around it means ahsoka's there and she had the connection with the daughter so i'd be interested if uh they kind of explain that a little more because with ahsoka gaining some popularity with mandalorian uh, they're obviously trying to row people into you know deeper connections and you know getting people to go back and watch watch clone wars the whole way through and you know give people a reward for seeing the the whole of the story yeah i mean uh and the one that you're talking about is called morai m-o-r-a-i just an amazing i thought um he he or she i don't actually know gender whatever it resembles um the daughter actually and i think that's because the daughter sacrificed her life after ahsoka died so i think that's why i think that's why she's always like around ahsoka and i think that's really cool because in season seven uh morai is flying around right over over vader and I think I have a feeling that Vader might have known that Ahsoka was alive from there, right? Um, even though he saw her lightsaber, because she really the you know that that honor or owl or whatever that really resembled the daughter, like it was vivid. You know, you could definitely see it, and that's because you know uh, Ahsoka sacrificed, or sorry, uh, the daughter sacrificed her life for Ahsoka. And I mean, it's really good that you transition to the Mortis arc because that's one of my favorite arcs, and I think the best thing about it is that it confirms Anakin being the chosen one, and in a sense, he was the chosen one by how I think about it is that when Anakin brought balance to that one world, he also brought balance to the galaxy in its own way, you know? It might have not been through himself, right? It might have been through Luke and Leia because in um, without saying too much about the sequel trilogy and everything, Luke and Leia did so much in the galaxy that changed it positively, right? Luke carried out the more spiritual side of the galaxy, the Force, right? And the Jedi that, uh, the Jedi that he created, uh, the Jedi that, you know, the Jedi Order that he created was different from the jedi that um were during the clone wars they were you know they weren't 
as scared, you know, of the dark side. You know, they actually, if I'm not mistaken, they explored certain aspects of the dark side, but it was just how they used it. You know what I mean? And I think that's how Anakin brought balance. It's not through just, you know, killing Palpatine, right? Supposedly killing Palpatine. And that is part of it, yes. But I think it's also from Luke and Leia, you know? It wasn't necessarily that Anakin himself brought back balance, even though he did. It was specifically that Luke and Leia shared that, you know, bringing back balance. Like, Leia helped in the Senate and everything. And it was just the state of the galaxy itself, you know? It's really cool. I think that trio thing to father, son, daughter, Luke, Leia, Vader, at least when Vader is still a thing, is interesting. I uh, try not to look up too many theories online because I like just coming up with my own if possible, which means usually the things I come up with people have already talked about. But every time I've watched the Mortis arc, all I can think about is just that that constant trilogy and trio theme we see in all of star wars and i think it's a thing in the real world too we really we really like things that come in threes as humans so just that luke leia vader dichotomy that we see in the original trilogy is really interesting to me and then yeah every time i watch that arc that's all i can think about is how we see their representations but just the roles have switched in my opinion like vader obviously is more of what we see as the sun in the mortis arcs or the dark Leia would be the light. And then I, I think Luke is so in the middle. And I think the prequel, tri- the sequel trilogy really shows you that constant wrestling he has with where his place is as in the world as a Jedi. And like you just talked about, I mean, like creating this new Jedi order that's different from, from the old and just being willing to explore some of those things that the Jedi of old were too afraid to, which I'll blame all on Yoda, but that's a topic for another day. I know I've probably seen Mortis three or four times now, and every time I just feel like I think I understand it, then I totally don't. But uh, I really like when Star Wars gets super, I guess, weird like that and metaphorical, and uh, stops. You know, you're you're watching something happen, but really, what you're watching is like what's going on behind the scenes. What does that actually mean? What is like what is the daughter? What is the son? And you know, what are their you know, sure, they're these beings, but really they're just, you know, the sides of the force. And I also absolutely love that uh, the portion of Rebels that has the portrait of the three of them to get to the world between worlds and that that animation style they use there. I thought that was super cool. Uh, So I hope we kind of continue to see that again. Maybe in Ahsoka, they'll get a little bit more into that. So one can hope. The Mortis arc, for some reason to me, every time I like watch the show, feels like it comes early. I always feel like it should come. I wish Ahsoka had a little more development before we get it, a little more confidence in herself in a way. I think she, I think by the time we get to that part of the show, a lot of the confidence she has, to me at least, feels a little bit like false confidence that she feels like she needs to have as Anakin's uh, Padawan. So I don't know. It would be interesting to me to see that whole arc with her from uh from her as a as a more grown a more grown person someone who has had more time to develop themselves um but also i think that would it could potentially ruin how fragile that arc seems to make anakin in a way especially after the father like wipes his memory of everything the son showed him it kind of i think he just knows deep down that there's something real bad that he's going to do Um, and I think it makes him really, really fragile. Yeah, I agree. I think that the part that you were talking about with uh, Ahsoka's development, I thought that was actually fine with the time that they gave us. I thought it was because, uh, you know, when when Ahsoka gets her vision, where it's an older version of her telling her, you know, like, careful, like, you know, you can't, you can't come so close to Anakin and everything. I think to an extent, she might actually, like, she might have actually believed it because, like, the, the vision and everything. I don't know, especially in season seven when she t- when she tells Obi Wan like tell Anakin right like like she knows Anakin is, is unstable isn't the best word but you know, he has so- like sort of a darker future to him and I think Ahsoka knows that for sure uh, based on the vision that she saw of course. The real question is are there they're Leku right the things that Togruta grow um when are we gonna get those that long in live action because that would be so cool i remember when she was live action in mandalorian when that came out everybody was so upset about that 
I just want to see that happen where they get that long. That means she has to get a lot older. So I'm willing to believe that she is alive during the sequel trilogy. She's just doing her own thing somewhere. I think aesthetically it would be hard for her, right? I mean, I mean, it would, it would look cool, obviously, but I, am, I think to do stunts and everything, like she was doing the fighting, whoever the actress was, she was doing like the fighting scenes with the magistrate in uh, Mandalorian. I'm pretty sure that would have been really hard because it would have been heavy, like on the on her head, right? Yeah, I think they touched on that in the um, uh, what is it, Disney Gallery for season two, or it was just on a Twitter thread that I read. But I think it was like a logistics thing where, for what she was doing, they would have to, you know, they had to make some compromises with the length of her uh, head tails. My, what I want now is Ahsoka like Yoda, but better. So we get the long head tails and then Ray or someone post sequel trilogy meets her and she's like Yoda, but like, doesn't make me mad every time I think about his role in the prequels. I thought Yoda's role in the prequels was interesting, especially towards the end, because um, when Yoda, uh, when Yoda has all those visions, when Yoda goes on his little journey, right? I think, I je- uh, I'm pretty sure he actually knew in Order 60, like that, that Order 66, or at least a variation of it, was coming because in the vision, and I've seen the episode so many times because it's so interesting. I need to watch that again. But you could, you could pre, you could see like in his vision, you could see the Jedi running at clones and striking them down, like very briefly, right? I, I put the frame like two, two times less. But that's not the important part. Um, yeah, you could actually see them running at him, and I think they, I think Yoda knew that Order 66 was coming, and that he. He didn't know when, but he knew that a very like the Jedi were going to end soon. And I think that his goal, when he said uh, "into exile and let's go fail," I have in my head. I always think of it like um, he failed to prevent it. And I don't know about prevent it necessarily. Like I know he knew it, it would come eventually because that was through the Force that he knew. But um, I think when he says that he failed, I think he failed uh, the Jedi as a whole. You know, um, because he knew that it was coming and he knew that something was going to happen. He was just a little bit more, fo- he was just a little bit foolish, you know, compared to the Jedi, for example, in the higher public are a bit more flexible. You know, he was too, they were too caught up in the politics of the war to actually realize what was going on behind the scenes. You know, I like the, uh, on that point, like the aspects that they're bringing in from the high Republic where like, they're kind of showing why the Jedi got into that situation. Why, how like their growth as, uh, kind of like the police for the republic in general tie them too closely to it and will inevitably lead to their downfall so i'm interested to see like you know the how they go from you know thinking because a lot of the people in the high republic are a lot of the the jedi are you know pretty clear that they're separate from the republic uh so i'm interested to see how they continue to get closer and closer Still, my favorite part of Light of the Jedi was less Yoda presence than I was expecting. On that idea, actually, of things being separate, uh, I, in watching season seven again recently, rewatched that Bad Batch arc, and I am excited for the show. Apparently, there's a trailer that I haven't watched. Um, I'm not going to watch it, but if you guys mention something from it, it's fine, but um I I think until I knew the show was coming out about the Bad Batch, I never really like paid as much attention to that arc um, in season seven. I think I was just trying to like push through to the end to watch Order 66 happen. I don't know why I wanted to do that, but I never paid as much attention to it as I had the last couple times I've watched it. And just the I think what I like more than anything about that arc is just the difference in relationship. The uh those clones have with each other they're very they're very funny and i don't know they always just it's just a little bit of a bit of humor that i think we need in that season just the way they interact with each other and now knowing that we get to see that again i am very excited for i mean bad batch is i'm more excited for it than any of the other shows coming out even kenobi like i'm I'm more excited for it than anything because it's basically clone war season eight (laughs) it's basically what it is but Um, I think an amazing thing about it is um, the fact that they are going to bring Echo um, into it, obviously, because, uh, and I think that's actually perfect because um, a lot of the clones, like, we don't, we don't really know what their fates are. And then now they're finally giving us Echo, you know what I mean? Like, we all thought that Echo was gone, that's it, you know, um, before, but this arc 
or at least the unfinished version. I watched the unfinished version. I found out he was alive, but I didn't know they were actually going to animate at the time. But we actually found that Echo was alive and everything. And I thought, I thought it brought sort of like hope, you know, like I'm genuinely excited of uh, to see how they tie in, you know, actual clone wars into the clones like heads, you know, like what they're thinking about the actual clone wars, you know, because they're going to reflect it, you know, like it's, it's there. I mean, eventually it's, it's going to be kind of weird. Cause I know in the Kanan comics, one of the clones that was go that executed Depa Balaba, Kanan's master, um, he he was actually he actually came back all the way and he didn't get his chip removed. He was thinking about why the Jedi were killed and everything, and he came all the way back, sacrificed himself, and let Gregor and or sorry Kanan and that other guy escape. Right, uh, Kanan's companion. I don't know who it is. Um, he let both of them escape, and I think that's amazing because we might actually see that with Bad Batch. Um, briefly in the trailer, I saw uh, Bad Batch and another clone. They were fighting, right? Either that was just like some sort of, I don't know, food fight in the cafeteria, or that's like a legit fight. Maybe they turn against the Empire because they realize that there's something wrong or they get their chips removed. And I'm genuinely so excited to see that. And I want Echo to remember Fives. It's going to break my heart, but we need that. Like, we deserve that because they were best friends, you know? Yeah, I think I'm definitely more excited for it with the addition of Echo. I'm not like a huge 80s action movie fan. So the Bad Batch kind of being like, you know, the A team, but for clones didn't really do, wasn't really the, the thing I was looking for. But the way they brought in Echo and knowing that, you know, yeah, there's potential that they're going to, it's going to be post 66. So they're going to, you know, either fight clones or have engaged with clones. I'm, I'm interested in the idea of like where they're going is far as you know uh, the clone perspective after already 66 happens bad batch isn't the show i'm the most excited for i actually don't know which one i'm the most excited for but i do like that they're continuing to touch on the clones like we've been talking about um but also just keeping away from people we consider main characters still like we're getting an ahsoka show and we're getting a kenobi show but i think it's Something that's really important to continue to touch on is where how all these other people that we don't necessarily get to see all the time are affected by this, especially people who were obviously directly involved in the Clone Wars. So I'm interested to just get more of that. And then I think, too, for a lot of people, they don't, for them, the Star Wars content they get is uh, live action or animated. It's only like TV shows, things they can watch. So there's plenty of people who don't know things about what happens post order 66 like immediate post order 66 because they just they don't have the access to the materials or the books or the comics so i'm interested to see them just continue to put more lore into live action and give us more extra lore outside of books and comics and stuff but things that more people can grasp onto because that always makes the community bigger and makes the conversations better yeah i agree it gives us more uh <laughs> chance to do this podcast and everything um i think uh i think an amazing thing about the clones is that um their individuality in um in the umbara arc they they sort of they sort of exercise depend uh independence more i mean a lot of the clones follow the jedi a little bit blindly you know what i mean um they almost worship them like they don't they don't question their motives or anything they don't question anything they're right away and i think that's um that's why um, Anakin's, you know, battalion is the, is like sort of the outlier here. Anakin is always sort of like an unconventional Jedi in a good way. You know, he's like he's not he's not very orthodox in terms of a Jedi. Like compared to someone like Obi Wan, like the plans and the strategies are so different and so extravagant sometimes. Like that one arc or not the one where R two gets lost. I think I don't remember exactly where, but they're on those asteroids and um, I think it was Booth one B U T E B U T H A W I and Booth. I don't know, whatever. Something like that. They were fighting Grievous, and then they were on the. Uh, they they set down ATTEs on the asteroids. And then, like they fired on the ships. Like that was an insane type of thing. Like no one ever could have thought of that. Besides someone like Anakin, right? Or the one with um, the one where he rammed the Venator cruiser into the separatist um, separatist ship. That was an even more amazing part of it. Um, and I think that's what that's what makes uh, the clones question Pong Krell in. Uh, that arc because in umbara arc because they genuinely see a flaw in his plans and not because of plan itself i mean anakin could have commanded that and it would have been different why because anakin isn't like the type of person to put people at risk you know what i mean anakin is always always trying 
to save people. He has that compassion in him. He can be a little reckless. I think that's what he was in the beginning of the show. But later, he's always trying to save the clones. You know, when he lands on um, Scipio uh, in that my in that uh, bank th- in the bank episode where a bank arc where they were um, they were investigating Rush Clovis and everything. After Thorn dies, he's like for the Republic, right? Uh, you could see briefly that Anakin's like checking, like looking at the clones and stuff like that. And he actually crouches down and checks one of the clones if he's like dead or alive. And then he keeps on moving. And you could see that briefly. And I think that's amazing. And it's a small detail. And maybe I'm like looking at it too much, but um, it's really cool because it shows how compassionate and loving Anakin is. And that's why the clones are always confused. You know, whenever they get, you know, a reckless order, they expect people to die. Obviously, that's natural because it's a war. But um, they don't expect that many people to die, especially in the face of a plan that's horrible, you know? And I think that's amazing because that's the type of, you know, that's the type of soldier that you need, right? You need someone who can think on his feet because the plans that they have were always successful. I mean, they only lost Hard Case. And of course, I'm not I'm not saying that Hard Case was going to be lost or like I'm happy about it. That, that shattered me, you know, like live to fight another day, boys, live to fight another day. It blew my mind, but... I think it was really cool to see the clones actually think for themselves, you know what I mean, instead of just blindly following. And I think that's another problem with Dogma and some of the Imperial officers, you know, in Mandalorian, that one guy who annoyed everyone, the one that Mayfeld killed, he was so annoying, you know. That was just the blind loyalty that no one really wants to see because it shows the ignorance in a way because they only see one vision, you know, uh, and that's the Empire's vision. And now I'm going on a tangent, so... That's basically all I'm going to say about it. But that's what I think I love about the clones in the Umbara arc. It's just the independence and um, their, you know, their their creative thinking. Yeah, no, I actually think that the the point about you know the blind loyalty is interesting because not only is there you know the blind loyalty with the clones following the Jedi and then the you know the within the Empire, but what I think the Clone Wars started showing, and uh, I think that. The High Republic is also going to show is kind of like the types of Jedi that didn't exactly believe what the castle, you know, was going for. And I think that, you know, there's examples in, uh, I think it's Masters and Apprentice, uh, Rail Avaros is a good example, but then we also get a lot in the way of uh, uh, Quinlan Voss, um, especially in the Dark Disciple book where, you know, he's drinking at a bar for you know all the intermediate chapters of that book just kind of hanging out and then he'll go and get a mission and uh i like to see that you know the the council is very stringent in its ways but i think that there's a lot of different jedi that have different views on things and i really liked seeing that point of view yeah, Quinlan Voss is really an orthodox Jedi, and I really like his personality generally. And I think um, it was amazing how they did it in Dark Disciple. They did his um, development so smoothly. You know, generally he's more reckless in the beginning, but then in Dark Disciple he's more careful and actually compassionate, especially when he falls in love with Asajj Ventress. And honestly, that was one of my favorite Star Wars couples. I thought it was really, really cool. Um, just uh, his um, his development in that in that book was really cool, especially when. Um, he learns how there were other people who were hurt. You know what I mean? And I think, um, especially when he turns to the dark side, seeing that uh, Asajj Ventress killed his master, you know, it shows how, in a way, he was sort of like Anakin, but not entirely, you know? Like, he was a Jedi master, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he was Aayla Sakura's master, um, but not... Because he was a Jedi Knight, obviously, at that time, but I'm pretty sure he was promoted to master. I'm not sure if he sat on the council, though. You know, he's he's like sort of like Anakin in terms of um, when, he, when he actually sees that Asajj's you know, Asajj does that, uh, that she killed his master. But I think it was mostly because of the torture. Um, Quinlan Voss is an example of a pretty good Jedi. I think he really reminds me of a Jedi that would be in the High Republic. I think the point you made about him being like Anakin, I think we don't necessarily... I think Anakin kind of got off easy with being able to show his personality, um, especially in the prequel trilogy, because of that whole Chosen One title. So I think when we get to explore characters like Quinlan Voss in that book and we finally, the Jedi order is gone as we knew it. And so getting to finally have them, I don't know, expose their own personalities is really, really nice because of the fact that there's nothing holding them back. And then on that idea of the council being flawed, just 
when Obi-Wan mentions that the council doesn't always like know what it's doing or make the right decisions or have all the information in season seven, just having that kind of felt like validation in a way for a lot of the other things I think we all feel as Star Wars fans. But there are always plenty of other Clone Wars things to talk about. I don't know if it's my favorite arc, but definitely up there is uh, Siege of Mandalore at the end of season seven. I partially, I am definitely partial to it because I think it's the prettiest of all the arcs. Um, everything that happens between Maul and Ahsoka and just some of the like transitions and stuff we get. And then I always think specifically of I think it's in episode nine uh, where Ahsoka lands, like she jumps down and lands on that platform and there's all this stuff exploding behind her and she's like got her lightsabers pulled out and that just makes me so happy. Yeah, um, I think the thing that struck me the most was actually the soundtrack in the show. Um, it was really, really, really good. Um, I'll let someone else touch on that because um, I have to um, think about it really quick. I mean, I could talk about the music in Star Wars for days, but I think season seven does the best job of, in the Clone Wars series specifically, in my opinion, of using the music as a tool. It, for me at least as a musician, in the other six seasons, the music is really good, but it's not always, unless you get those like, those main themes that we know about in Star Wars. So the big, those big themes, it, some of it just kind of goes unnoticed in a lot of ways. So when we get, especially at the end of season seven, that music really feels like it adds something. I don't know. It feels more present in a way. And I think it's helpful that at this point it's all Disney and stuff and we've got a ridiculous amount of money being able to be thrown at it and we've got a better animation style. And as you can tell, all the voice actors have grown up a little bit um, and the voices have changed. But just the way the music actually works in this season, I think works better than it does in honestly a good amount of star wars in my opinion yeah in episode 11 i think i sent it in the discord chat a few days ago the the soundtrack right after they get maul in custody um it's like really i, I don't know if you guys want to search it up or something it's unreleased but you can find it on youtube people cut out the background noise and everything the moment that boca is like goodbye ahsoka tano right and then they part ways the music starts getting super haunting and super low to a point where the thing is they did that on purpose and i'm sure of that because everyone knows what's going to come next no one doesn't know that okay revenge of the sith literally just started anakin just killed dooku he was assigned to that thing everyone knows what's going to come next it's order 66 and they know that for sure and they're making it haunting because you know you know that it's going to happen but you don't know when or how you're just like yoda in this case here right you you have that haunting like the music in the background and when they hear the, you know, when they, when Ahsoka starts hearing those visions, her and Maul, the music just starts getting more and more intense. And it's just, it's so, so cool, right? And especially after um, Rex tries to execute Ahsoka, he's like, find him, find him, find him, find him, find him, right? Um, the music is, I think it was, I'm so sorry when uh, Obi-Wan's like talking to, um, to Padme and like, Anakin's the father, isn't he? Right? Yeah, that part. Just the music is so striking, and I'm, they use different parts of all the, you know, of all the prequels and everything um, to just sort of tie it into this final arc, and that struck me the most. I think about um, episode eleven specifically. Yeah, the thing that I probably like most about that la that final arc is just like all of the payoff we get from like Maul's transition throughout the the Clone Wars. I mean, going from finding him at the bottom of the pit and getting his spider legs to regular legs and then him just you know working his way up through mandalore and you know getting the dark saber and it, it, there's just so much you know the whole savage arc uh, i feel like maul is is one of the best parts of clone wars by far and the the duels with uh with ahsoka at the end there is just like it, like you're saying christian it's just like it's beautiful. It the the animation it's just grew so much over those last like you know, those years that we didn't have it. They they the technology caught up so good that uh they could finally make it look, you know, the way I think it deserved to look the whole time. Especially looking back at that two thousand eight movie and just like where the animation style was and how the computer graphics looked at the time. 
I think one of the things I really like about that final arc too is that Ahsoka and Maul seem like the perfect matchup in every single way. They are exactly the per- the two that should have gone up against each other. Um, Ahsoka being disillusioned from the Jedi and Maul being disillusioned from the Sith. Just the the way those two the whole the way those two just end up interacting and you can see the confusion in both of them even though Maul tries to tries to act like he knows what he wants I think I don't think he does at all he just other than killing Kenobi but uh I don't know I just think seeing those two disillusioned from the things that they were in a way raised in the force in is uh interesting to me yeah, um, actually, Maul was uh, a really interesting character because he knew that Order 66 was coming. And you could tell by his, I think that was the best, like, you know how, like, the, the movement feel more, felt more human? I don't know, like, the, when they actually were moving and everything. When he, like, pointed outside uh, to the, like, the, at the window, he's like, I lured him here to kill him, right? He's referring to Anakin. That was so cool, right? Like, the, just the movements that they're making with their faces and everything. And, like, also the voice acting. He genuinely sounded like insane, like mentally insane. And I thought that was perfect because he has no idea what's going on. First, he wants to kill uh, Kenobi. Second, he wants revenge on Sidious. And he's just like, um, you know, he's like, every time he mentions Sidious, he's like looking around, right? I thought that was the best detail of this entire arc right here. The, the fear, like the, the actual fear and like um, paranoia that he has, like when he's looking around because he's scared, he doesn't know if Sidious is like right around the corner because he literally is behind everything. You know, like behind the entire state of the galaxy. I think Ray Park actually did some of the mocap for season seven for Maul. Yeah, he did the yeah he did the combat. Yeah. Yeah, like really, it comes out that you know they had the technology to do that because it's a lot more fluid. The fact that he knew about Order sixty six just the fact that there are people, those few people out there who knew, just is a little uh, sad and scary of a thought. That in the end, there are some way somehow. This could have potentially been prevented, but there are the people like Maul who might have known that obviously didn't care if the Jedi got destroyed. But then, like we've talked about earlier with Yoda, kind of knowing in a way, um, just as always, I will slander on Yoda for the rest of my life. But I don't know, just the the fact that that could have been prevented always will always bother me until the end of my days that things could have gone differently. Um, And then just everything tying up at the end of that arc with watching order 66 happen in real time like that not just watching anakin kill children is uh in a way more traumatizing than watching anakin kill children because we're connected to all these characters especially the clones because you can see it in their fa- in some of their faces just how painful this is and then watching all of those clones with the ahsoka paint that they put on their helmets it makes me cry every single time yeah, I think um, I actually, I'm not kind. Of, I'm not trying to sound cocky or anything or like arrogant, but I genuinely, I knew for a fact that at the end of the arc, we would see Vader. I don't know how. Like, I just, I felt like it was gonna happen. You know what I mean? And like, I um, after Ahsoka and um, after Ahsoka and Rex bury up the bodies and everything, I like for the first time I checked that I watched that arc. I I checked how much time there was left. And I saw the two minutes. I was like, 100, percent we're gonna see Vader. And then I saw the shuttle landing, and I was like, that's it. We're seeing Vader right now. I think I'm really excited because I think that Bad Batch will have the transition between the uh, clones to the Stormtrooper armor. And I think we're actually going to get to see that in uh, Clone Wars, you know, the animation. And now now I'm deviating from the course. Now back to Vader. That scene was so powerful, especially because some people said that they saw Anakin's eyes. And I felt like I saw Anakin's eyes. I don't know if it was like intended or something. It could have just been like how it looked in general. I thought it was really cool that um, Anakin genuinely, and you know, I, You know, like Vader actually looked, it wasn't, you couldn't see any expression, obviously, but it felt like you could feel the expression, right? When he's looking up at uh, Morai, like he looks at the lightsaber, he turns it on. When he turns around from all that, um, the helmet, you know, how it was like cracked, like the Ahsoka helmet, it sort of encapsulated the entire Clone Wars. And I'm probably reading into this way too much, but I saw it like as um, it was Ahsoka, right? And then, you know, it's the clone, right? The clone is also there. And then there's Vader walking away from it. And that's how Order 66 is, right? Ahsoka's shattered. And then Vader's walking away. Anakin's walking away from Ahsoka, which is on the helmet, basically. And the clones, they're all, you know, they're all gone, basically, right? You don't have the clones that you had before, the nice, compassionate, right? The brave soldiers. No, now they serve the Empire. They're heartless in a way, right? And 
that was really really cool i uh i don't think unlike you i mean i don't think i was expecting to see vader i think i should have but i uh wasn't expecting it but um just that whole end of the show is just so so emotionally intense even though um like you said we don't see his face we can't he doesn't can't really give off much body language through the Vader suit, but there's still that you feel that emotion. And I think a lot of that comes through the music, but just in the few actions we see him do, you feel a lot of emotion. Seeing Vader at the end there is just a really nice, like feather in the cap on the clone wars in general. Um, I think that, you know, watching his transition, like we were talking about earlier, you know, like the little spurts of anger that he has, you know, even in seasons like you know one and two leading up and then obviously moving through order 66 and all that i mean it's just the clone wars even though it has all these different arcs and you know bits and pieces of different jedi in the end it's it's anakin's journey from you know getting a a padawan who was the castle's way of seeing if he could eventually lose something to uh you know finally proving that he can't and turning into vader so I just thought that was a really nice way of ending things. Clone Wars definitely, in a way, ties up a lot of loose ends that we needed to tie up in the prequel trilogy. But with the end of Season 7 comes the end of this episode of the podcast. Um, We always have books coming up that we're reading. So as I mentioned earlier, Dawn of the Jedi and then Victory's Price coming out really soon. So that will be uh, that'll be a good read. I'm very excited for that. Um, and if you guys, as always, you guys can come join us in Star Wars Book Club if you'd like to take a look at those books. And then after the next episode that will come out after this is going to be March 19th. So just watch out for that. But thank you guys for giving us a listen. It is always awesome to get to talk about Clone Wars, especially with Amin, who knows everything about Clone Wars. So, <laughs> And as always, we need to thank our editor, Obi-Wan Coyote. He is fantastic and just dealing with all of this for us so we get to do the easy work of talking about Star Wars. But thank you guys for joining us for this episode of Hyperspace Comlink, and may the Force be with you. See you guys later. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks again, everyone, for listening to this edition of the Hyperspace Comlink Podcast. Be on the lookout for our next episode, where the focus shifts to the Rebels television series. Until then, stay safe, and may the Force be with you.